All right, guys, let's just get right into it. So you're going to want to put the camera in video mode, of course. Turn it on. What we're going to do is we're going to go into the menu. And we are going to turn Zebra on. But the first thing we're going to do is go up here to Main. What you really want to do first is go to Main 2. And then right here, you want to switch the camera to Log Shooting on Flexible ISO. And then this is the option I use here, S Gamut 3 Cine. Embedded LUT, you have that on. Turn that on, okay? So next thing we're going to do, we're going to go into the menu. And I'm also, I have the camera in manual mode as well, just so you know. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to scroll down here to exposure. Then we're going to go down until we get to the zebra area, which is right here. So zebra display, we're going to turn that on. Then we're going to go into zebra level custom one. Now this is key. So what you got to do is here on the left side, you're going to have to scroll down. So like by default, it starts up here like this. Just scroll down until you get to the C1 option. Then hit this side button over here to go over. And what you're going to do is you're going to set this number to 41 and then you're going to go over one more and set the plus minus to two. Now, where I got this information from is from Sony's Cine website. So I will have that linked below the video and I'll show you what that looks like. I'll bring it up on the screen. Excellent article and it explains how S-Log3 works with like cinema cameras like the FX3, FX6, FX9 and so forth. But this method actually also works really, really well for the A6700. I used it also for my A7C2. I also used this method for my A7C, even though that was S-Log2, I just had to adjust some numbers. So S-Log2, you would use different numbers here as opposed to what I'm using. I made a video on S-Log2 if you need to uh, learn how to do that, but S-Log3 is different, and this is where you want to have it set for your zebras. Now, what this number is referencing is middle gray. Now, what middle gray is, is what these charts are. You've probably seen these charts. People hold them up. This one's super cheap. I'll have it linked below. You don't have to use a chart like this, but you definitely do want to have something that's this color, you know, so you can use one of these things. These are much more expensive, but it gives you the option for all the different colors so you can, like, highly calibrate your uh, video file in, like, Final Cut Pro, for example. You can get all the colors perfectly accurate with a chart like this by referencing each color in the editing program. But again, we're keeping this very simple for this video, so I'm just going to use this gray card here. So that's what the 41% number does. It's going to it's going to basically put zebras on this gray card when the exposure is correct. So let me show you what I mean. All right, so now you guys can see the back of the camera and you can see me like holding up this chart and stuff. But so check this out. When I hold this up, you should see the zebras on this chart. See that? So that's how you know the exposure is correct. And that plus and minus two is what's limiting the zebra to just that little strip there. And depending on how you have it aimed at the light, so you would want to hold this like where your face is for a proper exposure. And then if you turn it just that little bit, you can see when the light reflects off of it, you get the zebras. And again, that's how you know the exposure is correct. Alrighty, so now I am recording using the A7C2 here so you can see the screen while it's pointed at me. Um, I couldn't really effectively do this without seeing the screen pointed at me. So now, if you look at this chart, again, you could see the zebras showing up. Now, watch when I change the aperture. You can see the image is getting darker. And now you can see here in the center, that is the metering mode. And because I have the camera set to manual mode, and I have the, ice, the ISO fixed at 800, the metering mode is acting as a metering mode. So if I go into the ISO area here, also note that there's lines on the ISO when you go lower than 800. And you don't want to use those. Those are like expandable, flexible ISO. You can use them to dial in the exposure, but you really want to change the exposure by either changing your light power or changing the lens aperture because you, you want to use the camera when you're using S-Log in the base ISOs. And there's two base ISOs for the A6700. It's ISO 800 and ISO 2500. So if you're in lower light situations, you're going to want to use ISO 2500 and then adjust the lighting and the lens aperture as you, as you need to to get the exposure correct. But again, if you're shooting in a regular studio environment like this, ISO 800 should be where you want. And again, the reason why you want to use these base ISO numbers is because that's going to give you the max dynamic range that the sensor is capable of producing and it'll give you the best colors and quality as well and the lowest amount of noise so all these things factor in so anyways 
Let me change the aperture, or let me just put the ISO back to 800 here, like so. And now if I just dial in the aperture, you can see it's getting darker, darker, darker. And again, notice that metering mode there. Now it's at zero and you can see the exposure is pretty good. So if I raise it up more, like so, you can see now it's overexposed. Now, you can overexpose. You can see here it is a little bit overexposed and that's because it's averaging the entire scene. So if I had some bright stuff behind me, the exposure might be a little higher. What's important, guys, is to reference where you need the exposure to be. So for this purpose right here, I'm exposing for my face. And that's what this gray card does. Another key thing that you're definitely gonna wanna do is set custom white balance. It's critical to get accurate skin tones, and let me just show you how to do that really quick. If you go into the function menu here by hitting the function menu button, by default on the bottom uh, corner there, you'll see the white balance. So if you go into white balance and you scroll down, again on the left hand side you have these options. If you scroll down to custom one, and then you go over to the right, and then you click set by just pressing the center button on the back of the camera, like so. Now that square box comes up. So now all you have to do is hold the gray card in that square box and then hit the center button on the back wheel and that will adjust the white balance. And you can see it set it to 5300 Kelvin. So that is the custom white balance. So that will give me the most accurate colors um, which is critical for skin tones. So keep that in mind. So now I have custom white balance set. I have the ISO set at the base 800, which is where I want it for this scenario. And I'm dialing in the aperture to adjust my exposure. So here's where it gets a little bit more complicated, but not really. So in my studio, I like having the lens at the maximum aperture for the best background blur. So if I open this aperture up to f 2.8 in my case is the max aperture for this particular lens because I'm using the 16 millimeter Sony lens f 2.8 You could see now it's a little bit overexposed So what I would need to do is I would need to put like sunglasses on front of the lens to make it a little bit darker The other thing I could do is I could lower my light source But sometimes you can't do that for example in my studio I'm balancing an overhead rig that's at f4 right now. I'm using my Sony a7 IV as my main studio camera and it has the Zeiss Battis 25 millimeter f2 lens on it and I have it set to f2. So because that lens is at f2 and this lens up here is at f4, I can't have them exposed the same. You know what I mean? Like in order to have them exposed the same, I have to put an ND filter on the Battis lens to like put sunglasses on it to darken it down because this lens is at f4. So it's getting a little bit, maybe a little more complicated, but I'm bringing this up because if you're overexposed, which is very common when using S-Log because it forces you to use ISO 800 as the base ISO. So if you're outside ISO 800, it's probably gonna be overexposed, especially if you have a fast aperture. Now, if you stop it down to like F5.6, F8, things like that, you'll probably be fine. But if you're trying to do like portrait work or you want depth of field play and you have the lens opened up like F1.4 lens, for example, you know, you're definitely gonna need a heavy ND filter. And that's why I have variable ND filters for all my cameras. So when I'm filming, I can always just dial in the exposure really easily when I wanna use those wider apertures. So that is the basics of how this works um, when it comes to exposing. Now, when you're outside, the process is exactly the same. However, it's a little bit harder to judge outside what to expose for. So what I usually do is I'll hit the display button here on the back of the camera and it'll bring up the histogram. So you can see the histogram right there. And I use that as reference when I'm outside. So I try to get it so it's the highlights aren't clipping basically. So it's gonna look a little bit overexposed when you're outside in general, but I just make sure that the highlights aren't clipping and you can always like bring it back in Final Cut as long as the highlights aren't blown out. That's pretty much it. It's like I said, it's not as hard as you might think to use S-Log. Another key trick that I'm gonna show you when we get on the computer in a second in Final Cut is you can download Sony's technical LUTs and they offer technical LUTs for S-Log 3. So I really enjoy using them. So what you do is uh, I'll have a link below the video. You can download, download them for free. They come from Sony, like they're from Sony they're free and basically when you import the footage into Final Cut you can apply the LUT and it'll get that log footage like really close to where you want it you know for as far as grading goes so it makes the grading process way easier especially if you're a beginner so I need to record some footage here so we can play with it 
So let's see here. We're overexposed a little bit. So let me hit record. So right now we're at plus, let's see. It's not too bad. It's just a little bit overexposed because I'm not really seeing it. So if I bring up the aperture a little, right around F4, F4 seems to be like the perfect exposure for this particular scene with this lighting conditions right now. I'm just recording right now. Like I said, here we are at F4 looking good. Let's bring this footage into Final Cut and I'll show you guys how to grade it quickly using those technical LUTs, but that come are free from Sony. And I'll also show you how to do it without the technical LUTs. Both are pretty easy, but I find the technical LUTs a nice advantage. All right, so here is where I got the information from. And you can see on the top here, I'll have this article linked below in the description area, but this is where I got the article. It's from Sony Cine. And here's all the information. It's going over it for, you know, the FX3 and stuff. And here's the information right here. As you can see, 41% skin tones. If you want to expose four skin tones, you would set the zebra number to 48 to 52. Notice I was using the gray card. So the middle gray is 41, as you can see by this chart. Now, if you're doing a 90% reflectivity white card, you would set the number to 61%. So again, there's lots of different methods. Some people will use the maximum number before the highlights clip, and they'll use that for their zebras. That's another way to do it. Um, but I prefer to do it the way that Sony shows us, which is this method here. Now, those LUTs that I was telling you about that are free that you can download from Sony, are here. This will also be linked below and you can see the link for this. This is Pro Sony and right here on the bottom you're going to want this one. The 3.01 megabyte one cube file and you can just hit this download button over here and that's where you would get that. Now here in Final Cut Pro this is what we are looking at. I just started a new project and I brought the clip down right here. So this is the clip and you can see that it doesn't really look very good exposure wise. So remember how I told you about how you can use that 3D LUT? Well, this is where you would go to do it. You just select the clip and you can go into this info option here and it's actually down here, but you might not see it. So what you need to do instead of on basic, you need to change this to like general and now it'll open up the option for the camera LUT here. So you see how it says none. This is where you can go and find those LUTs that you downloaded. Now, just for reference, mine are here and they're in the download folder. So that's where they are for me right now. I didn't move them, I just left them in my download folder. So when I go over here, so if you go to add custom camera LUT, you can just navigate to wherever you saved yours. Now, like I said, mine are in the downloads folder right here. So that's where they are. Once you, once you do that, they will appear in this list here. So the only reason that these bottom three are in this list is because I already did the add custom LUT option right here. So anyways, what I'm gonna select is this option right here, S-Log3, S-Gamut3 Cine. So let me click that and bam, look. I mean, it already is almost perfect, you know? Not really, you could still dial it in in a lot of ways, but you could see how much of a difference just adding that technical LUT did. Now, let me just turn that off for a second. I'm just gonna do none again. And I wanna show you, if I go to view and I go to video scopes, this is what the histogram looks like right now. And you can see like 100 is all the way up here and zero is all the way down here. So you can see there's a lot of room to stretch this footage out. Now, watch what happens when I apply this LUT. You see how the histogram changed? Like it stretched it out for you. Like it kind of did the work for you. Now, the way that you would do this if you didn't want to use a LUT, if I go back to none here, is if you just go up to your color option here on the top, this little triangle, what you can do is you can drag your highlights up and you could technically go all the way up to like 100, but I know that's going to be too bright. So I'm going to go right around here and then I'm going to drag my shadows down a little bit. Something like that. And then I'm going to drag my midtones down quite a bit to dial in the look that I'm going for. And then I'm going to drag up the saturation somewhere right around there. So you can see like that looks decent, you know, for a quick grade. So yeah, you could use it. You could grade it either way. You know, like I said, using the LUTs is like a nice like shortcut. It, I feel like it gets you there quicker. So I really like using the technical LUT, but it's nice to fine tune it. So for example, if I go here, let me just reset the parameters. And let me go back and add the LUT. And again, this is a technical LUT. This isn't like 
a LUT that, you know, you can download that is just turnkey where it'll give you like a specific look, you know, there's so many out there. This one is just to help you get grading easier. I mean, that's the way I look at it anyway. So I applied the LUT, so now you can see I can still stretch this a little bit more, so I could bring the highlights up just a little bit. Something like that, and then I can bring the shadows down right about there, bring down the midtones, and then I can drag up the saturation just a touch. And then as far as the skin tones go, sometimes they look a little bit red on Sony cameras, I notice. That Oompa Loompa look, some of us call it. So what you can do to help fix that, if you go to your midtones and you just drag your red channel, this is just one way to do it, guys. I'm not saying this is the best way, the right way, whatever. This is just an easy way to try to pull out a little bit of the red. If you just go to the color midtones and drag the red down, like, you know, a little bit, something like that, that will help just pull that little bit of extra red you might see in the skin tones. I'm still playing with this and refining my techniques, of course, as I get more experience, but at, for now, that seems to be working pretty darn good. Okay, so here now we're looking at an outside clip. I just wanted to show you what it looks like outside. And remember, I told you that I basically use the histogram for outside and it tends to look a little bit overexposed. It's a little bit harder to judge outside on depending on what you're exposing for. So in this case, I was exposing for this awesome Polygon T6E mountain bike and the mountain bike was being backlit. So the sun was behind the bike, like aiming more towards me. Uh, but anyways, this is how I exposed for it. And you can see on the left here what the scopes look like. And this is a representation of the histogram. So you can see my highlights are nowhere near being clipped and my shadows are nowhere near being clipped. So this is good for outside. So I just used the histogram on the screen, put it right around the middle there, and it's like, that's a good exposure. So my meter on the camera at the time, sometimes that'll vary. It'll be between zero and it might look like plus one sometimes, depending on the scene. But as long as your histogram looks good, you're good, and you can recover it. That's, again, the dynamic range advantage of S-Log is huge. So remember, you can go up here to the little eye on the top, and we can add the LUT. Now I gotta go to the general setting again. Sometimes that defaults back, I don't know why. I'm just gonna select the S-Log 3 here, and you can see that got it pretty far right out of the gate. So that looks pretty good. Now you could see the uh, histogram, how much it grew here. And it looks like I do need to lower the exposure just a little bit. So if I could just bring this down just a touch like so, right around here, looks pretty good to me. And again, guys, this is just feel. Uh, I'm just playing around with it. Now I'm gonna drag the shadows down a little bit. So just get that right close to the line there. Now mid-tones, I could bring that down a little as well if need be, right about there. Now I could bring the highlights up just a little bit more. And then I can drag the saturation up just a little bit, something like that. And now what I'm seeing is in the shadow areas, it looks like the tires are a little bit blue looking. So if I go into the shadows, um, I could actually drag you know, some blue out of the shadows if I wanted. Um, I could actually click this little dot here and I could drag like away from the blue, like blue's like over here. So I could drag like this way and that'll warm up the shadow areas a little bit. Um, just as an example, another thing I can do is I can drag the temperature up just a little bit. Somewhere right around 55 looks a little bit better. So now if I play back this clip, you can see it's looking really, really good. Now, one other thing I wanted to show you is up here on the color wheels. You might not have color wheels, so if you click this arrow right here next to the color wheels, you can change it to color board. And color board is what you have by default in Final Cut. So it might look like this. This works the same way as the color wheels. It's just a different representation of how it looks. So when you're adjusting your exposure, you would want to go here and drag down and stuff. So for example, I can just go here, drag down, then drag up the highlights. Don't need to go up, they actually need to go down a little bit. I could then drag down the midtones. I could then go to saturation and I can drag this up and get a very similar look. I could then go to color. So you can use the color board as well. I actually do like the color wheels better though. And you can see now I have two of them. So if I enable the color wheels, that's what that looks like. 
This is what the color board looks like. So again, you know, it's just a matter of preference and how you like playing with this stuff. Um, but I particularly like using the color wheels uh, in combination with that LUT. As you can see, this method works really well and it's actually not that hard at all. And then you get much more dynamic range. So it's super helpful for dynamic range in particular, especially outside. So remember what I told you using those tools, use your histogram, make sure you're not clipping the highlights, um, make sure you're at one of the base ISO numbers, either 800 or 2500 for the A6700. And then in addition, depending on what kind of aperture you're using, you might need to use an ND filter to lower that exposure value. So um, just keep that stuff in mind. Now, the A7C2, the ZVE1, the FX30, the FX3 all work very similar, but the full frame cameras do have different base ISO numbers. So you have to keep that in mind. I'll put them up on the screen. I can't remember what they are off the top of my head, but I'll put them up on the screen so you know for the full frame cameras what the base ISO numbers are. All right, guys, I appreciate you checking out my video. If you can give me a thumbs up, I'd really appreciate it. And it would be super cool if you subscribed as well. All right, take care. Have a good one.